All right, so we're going to get started on our panel discussion. Uh, to kick things off, um, I do have some um, questions that I've prepared. However, for those of you that are here tonight, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Uh, James, uh, will you help me monitor the chat so that we can make sure to ask the questions from any questions you have around networking? But uh, let me go ahead and start this off for each of you, Juliet and Chris. What does networking mean to you? Juliet, ladies first, please go ahead. Sure, I'm happy to. I'm so happy to start us out. Um, for me, and what I share with my clients often is, um, I believe that networking is really just about building a community of professionals who you want to grow with over the duration of your career. I think that it's long-term um, relationship development that is an investment in how you want to see yourself in the world as a professional, whether it's um, the kinds of mentors that you want to surround yourself with, the kind of leaders you want to partner with, or the kind of people you want to build some solidarity with when, when going gets hard, maybe you're job searching. But um, ultimately, I think it's just about developing the people that you want to grow with along, along your journey. Training. Chris, what about I would you? concur with a lot of that. Uh, I view it as a, a lot as a safety net. Um, it, it is people that I meet that when when I that I've gotten to know um, that I am there to help be a resource for them, um, but they're also there to help be a resource for me. Um, and it really is, you know, I, I've heard this saying: there, there's two types of networking. There, there's hunting and there's farming. And hunting is more of you walk into a networking group or whether it's virtual or in person and you're looking for a specific person to sell to or to get a job from or, or whatever the goal of your networking is. The farming is, is that you're there to build relationships. And believe me, when I was a new coach, I did a lot of hunting and farming works better. So who do you wanna let into your network? Who do you wanna let into your, your sphere? And, and who do you, cause, cause who do you want to, to be associated with not only now, but in the future and who can be a good resource for you? Yeah, the, the, my definition of networking has changed over time because when I first heard it, I was terrified by it. As a, as a new designer trying to start a business, I didn't know anything about what it was. I think I read the book, Duct Tape Marketing, and it said, go out there and do networking and here's all these places. And I showed up and I didn't know uh, what it was all about. And I think my definition has changed into a combination of what you just said, Juliet and Chris. It's all about developing relationships. For me, I like meeting new people and adding them into, you know, like, Almost, I have multiple spheres of people and I like to connect those spheres together. And that's, so that's kind of what networking is for me. I, the other thing that I think comes up is like, what are the benefits of networking? I know that, you know, in, in terms of uh, the design community, we use networking a lot for, or it, it's used a lot in terms of the job hunt, but that is contrasted against maybe just sending out applications or filling out applications and waiting to hear back. What are some of the benefits of, of networking regarding uh, finding a job? Okay, um, so just out of curiosity for the ones that I've, of you that I can see, um, raise your hand if your primary job search is Indeed or Glassdoor or something like that. That's your primary job search. So see a couple of hands going up, not, not many, but a couple. Um, your, so when it comes to the statistics of, of companies like Indeed, um, Indeed has between, about between a four and 7% success rate of actually placing you uh, on your next job. And when, what I tell my business owners is, is quite simply this. Yes, go ahead and put it. Put a, 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 a um, an add on Indeed or Glassdoor wherever you choose to, but also be looking around your existing network because the reality is statistically there's an 87 percent chance that as a business owner I already know the next person I'm going to hire is already somebody uh, in my network or I know somebody who knows the next person I want to hire. So getting out there, it, it, it's the equivalent of knocking on doors, kind of, um, but using your existing network is far and away statistically the best way to look for a job. 
And it basically, the way to think of, of LinkedIn is it's it's like uh, it's the electronic version of of answering the ad in the paper. For those of you who are old enough to remember that, you're you're asking some you're asking a business owner to to hire you when they really don't know anything about. You. Yeah, and I would love to add to Chris's, um, uh, you know, great ending phrase on like, they don't know anything about you, right? So something that's really, I think people underestimate is, and I'm going to, I'm going to keep building off your metaphors, Chris, with the garden, right? That um, something that you can't underestimate as a candidate is the opportunity to invite professionals into witnessing your growth, right? It is low stakes for you to share your process in a way that demonstrates key soft skills that can only really be believed in action. And so you're responsible as a candidate to be showing those skills in action in the way you're showing up on LinkedIn, in the way that you're showing up at these events, in the kinds of events you're participating in to demonstrate um, how you grow because you have to think long term. You're not always um, you're not always showcasing yourself for your next job. A lot of times you're showcasing yourself for the job you're going to get in five years after that person who was in your network saw you grow and evolve over those five years. But if you're not willing to be seen in process, you're actually eliminating the opportunity for those potential employers and. And, and hiring managers to be able to see those soft skills in action so that when they are ready for a candidate, they know that you can live up to those expectations because you've been practicing them regardless of whether there's a job on the line or not. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the one thing that I wanted to add on, on top of that is no matter whether you're selling yourself in, 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 a, in a job search or you're selling a product, people buy whether they're buying you as a prospective employer, they're buying a product or whatever it is, they buy based upon three key differentiators. They know you, they like you, and they trust you. And it really is that simple. I had to have a new roof put on my house several years ago, guys, and, and I did what any, any one of us would do. I went out and got a couple bids, and I actually used a guy that was a little bit more expensive, even though it was money right out of my pocket, because... I, people that I trusted recommended him, knew him, had used him and said, Hey, this is your guy. And that really is important uh, in a business owner's mind when they're making a hiring decision. If they got a choice between you, that somebody that they know, like, and trust and somebody that's an unknown quantity, nine times out of 10, they're going to pick the person they know, like, and trust. There, there is a question in the chat about LinkedIn, and I think it's important to kind of separate it. Uh, LinkedIn, as a networking tool, where you have followers and you're following people, is different from LinkedIn jobs, where you're looking for jobs. So that when you put the statistics out about Glassdoor and Indeed, Chris, does LinkedIn jobs also have that same kind of success rate, four to six percent? Yeah. Yes. Now, I will say um, the one thing, and, and this is really applicable to, to, to guys, to, to, to you guys, um, the higher your skill set, the more likely you are to find a job on LinkedIn. So when you're talking about that seven or eight uh, percent factor, those are people that have a higher skill set than somebody who uh, maybe just has a high school education or, or, or something like that. And people seek you out, right? Like, I mean, there's a lot of people like recruiters that are using LinkedIn to seek you out too. Yes, there are. Um, and, 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 but even then, you, a, a lot of times the, the recruiter, the recruiting world is a little is is a little bit like analysis through the looking glass type scenario. The recruiters get paid if they place you. If they don't place you, well, not all of them, but most of them get paid upon placement. Um, but there are some of them that are on retainer. Um, and it is very, you're, you're, if you're being headhunted, uh, like what you're talking about, Cindy, that's, that's basically what the term is for, being headhunted, your chances of success go way up. But it's still at its maximum if you're headhunted, depending on the skill of the headhunter and whether they're truly trying to place you in a, in a proper 
in a make sure it's a good fit, you're still only looking at about 35%. Mm -hmm. So networking is the way to go. Yes. <laughs> so scary, but the way to go. <laughs> so like let's start off with the the some of the common mistakes that both of you have seen with networking. Then I'll add some color after you all speak. But what are some common mistakes that you've seen when people start on this networking journey? I think the biggest thing that I see with um, all stage of candidates, I mean, I've worked with folks fresh out of college all the way to folks who are on their third career path and are kind of going for the gold of like that final um, kind of trifecta of their skill set in that latter part of their career. And hands down, I think the biggest mistake I see from people are two things. Um, one, taking people's time management personally, um, especially in a global pandemic, it's really important that you don't take other people's actions as an affront to your your character. Um, so if someone doesn't respond to you on LinkedIn for a month, it's probably not about you. Maybe one of them was sick. There was something in the household. Maybe the, the artistic director you reached out to has kids who are studying at school, at home. Like you really just can't speak to other people's experiences. So, so much about, um, about the, the um, tenacity of networking is taking responsibility for your actions and letting go of the mental clutter of trying to predict how or what other people's actions mean about you. Ultimately, it's generally not about you. And if you let the trends of how people are reacting to you get you down, it's really gonna put you at a disadvantage mentally to keep trying. Um, and then the other thing I would say, um, is it's really important to follow up <laughs> again with that like if i ghost you for a month it's not about you send a secondary message like if you really want to be in connection with me i'm expecting you to handle that emotion, right? I'm not the one who wants to meet with you. You're the person who wants to meet with me. So I'm expecting you to take ownership of that desire and follow up and say, hey, maybe I didn't catch you at the right time a month ago, but I just wanted to check in because I'm really invested in getting to know you and let me know if this isn't a good time, maybe when would be a good time for you. Um, and that goes for following up directly after an event that goes for following up after you've already reached out to somebody, right? If you're really invested in trying to establish a connection, it's really important that you take responsibility for that effort and you don't just quit at the first at the first sign of maybe a little bit of a difficulty or a roadblock um, if you're really in it for the, for the long haul. Yeah, I, I, you're so right on the follow-up. That is one of the biggest mistakes I see people make. And guys, I want to be, be honest with you. When it comes to follow-up, especially if you're at a live event, this is your best friend. The, so one of the things that, that I see that people do when they come in, uh, when, when they network, is they are not clear about what their expectations are and when it comes to the results of their networking. Anybody who thinks they're going to go to one networking event and walk out of there with a job after 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes of talking to somebody. I'm not saying it, it never happens, but guys, if somebody's offering to hire you after knowing you for 10 minutes, that should send up a red flag. It means they're desperate, they need a body, and you happen to be there. So one of the things that I look at when I do networking, and networking is the way I grow my business. I would say that probably 95, well, maybe 90% of my clients have come in some way, shape or form from networking. And so when I go to a networking event, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for one or two people that are willing to take that conversation to the next level that I can set up a one-to-one -one with so I can get to know them and they can get to know me and we can see if it's a good fit. And what I see happen way too many times, especially in live events, is you go to that, is you go to that event and you walk out of there and you say, oh, that was great. I really enjoyed getting, getting to know Juliet. I'm going to set up a one-to-one -one with her. We talked about it and we're going to set up a one-to-one -one at some point. For every day that that, that that goes by, that event goes by, your chances of getting that one-to-one -one drop precipitously. 
If you don't schedule that one-to-one right then and there, pull out your phone, sync calendars, set the one-to-ones, your chances of getting it after the event is over is almost non-existent. Get that one-to-one set up, get it on the counter. Yes, they can cancel on you. And yes, I've had that happen. And it's very disappointing to go to an event, set up a one-to-one and somebody ghosts you, cancels on you, whatever. It is very disappointing. But keep at it. If you just go to the event and you just talk to a bunch of people and you don't have a plan of what you want to happen and you don't set those one-to-ones, then you just went and paid, paid a bunch of money to have dinner or lunch or coffee or whatever it is with a bunch of strangers. And it's not going to work for you. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I would add on to that. It's the mistakes that I see are when you expect that you're just going to walk in once and it's going to be like, no, that you don't have to do it anymore. Or that they're obviously the follow-up, but also the persistence that's needed of like looking, finding, trying something out. Um, It takes some effort. I mean, I've always heard, you know, it's work. That's why it's called networking. (laughs) This is work. (laughs) So it's not something that just is going to be like, you know, something that you can just not put any effort into. It really needs to have a plan for before and the after. It's all really good. And and I would add on to that uh, measurable results. What are your expectations and how do you measure them? And I, I'd love to add to that kind of on this idea of intention and measurable results is that not, I mean, I've coached a lot of introverts and I definitely identify with the exhaustion component, especially with like returning to in-person events and the pandemic. And sometimes your measurable results don't have to always end up in a one-on-one. Maybe it's, you're just looking to um, practice your elevator pitch and it would be a success for you if you could talk to three people and feel really confident in introducing yourself. And that can be your win for that event. It doesn't always have to be this huge metric of I'm adding people to my roster. Um, You want to get to a place where you're comfortable with initiating those one-on-ones. But if you're in a place where you're starting out, you know, don't eat the elephant in one sitting. Um, Set measurable goals and ask yourself, like, what could be a win for me tonight? Like, what is a way that if I walk away from this event, whether it's in person or online, maybe I'm going to say, I'm going to get five LinkedIn URLs and I'm going to follow up with two of them, right? Like break your ideas into measurable goals. And then once you feel comfortable with that, then you level up. You don't have to jump to level 10 when you haven't even started at level one to three yet. So really think about what would be a win for me and then reach that and set your next win. And that's a really nice way to incrementally challenge yourself while still growing at your capacity. And that's okay. I agree. When, I did, when Before I started uh, my coaching career, I had never really done any networking. I mean, it was very intimidating for me. And so one of the things I, I did when I first uh, bought this business is I joined a BNI group, not because I was really expecting BNI to help me grow my business, I joined it because it gave me a safe space to practice my networking, to make mistakes, to have people give me feedback on what that um, marketing moment, elevator pitch, whatever we're calling it this week, um, to to give me some feedback on how effective it was and to keep trying it out and refining it and keep saying, and once I had it refined to say it over and over and over again until I was comfortable saying it and it just rolled off the tongue. And so a, a group like a BNI or a Toastmasters or, you know, maybe a smaller chamber of commerce, um, something like that can be really good for, for those of you who are more introverted and just need to practice. Because I did. I, that was one of my biggest falls, um, fears and, and flaws is I needed some, a safe pra- place to practice. I, I don't know if everybody knows this story, but like when I was first you know, trying to build uh, my agency. <laughs> I came from journalism, news. I didn't go talk to people. I wasn't a, I was a producer. We didn't talk to people. I specifically chose producing so I wouldn't have to talk to people, right? So here I am in this world where I, now I've got to go and network and figure out how to do it. Somebody invited me to a BNI. So unlike Chris, I had no idea <laughs> what to expect 
at this group. And I, you know, sat down at the table and they explained the format. And then all of a sudden they're going to go around and everybody has to stand up and say who they are and what they do for 30 seconds. I almost ran out of the room as they were going around the table. I thought I was going to throw up in my mouth. Like it was that terrifying for me to have to talk about myself to a bunch of people I didn't know, but I stuck it through and I kept doing it. And over time, it became more and more comfortable for me just from that repetitive practice to the point now where I don't mind getting in front of people and talking. I go and give speeches now. I talk to clients all the time. It's just, it's become, I flipped the script. And so that kind of experience is really beneficial, even if you're not going to start a business. It's really helpful to be able to speak to yourself or speak about yourself to potential hiring managers and can also brush up on your skills. So if you're, you know, a designer who has to talk about your designs and you're really nervous about it, Toastmasters, go and talk to practice at Toastmasters so you can get better at presenting your ideas to other people. It's going to come across as confidence in everything that you do. Those are all really good. I'm still scanning the chat. I only saw one question. So feel free to ask questions there. Um, I do have another one though. How do you, how, what do you recommend with finding networking events? And I'm using that as a broad like conference, you know, local events, remote events. What, what is your advice, uh, Juliet and Chris for finding uh, networking events? You wanna go first? Yeah, go for it. Okay, um, so Facebook is generally a good place to look for events. They, they have an events page. Um, I use LinkedIn. Um, a, a lot of times um, it, it depends on, on what my goal is. If I'm trying to get a client in a, in a specific um, industry, I'll look at like trade publications, whether they're virtual or you know, an actual magazine. Some of, some of the construction companies the blue collar stuff, they actually still have magazines, believe it or not. Um, and so, and then uh, sites like Eventbrite, things like that. It, it, and also the other thing I do is that if I'm having a one-to-one -one, um, with, with Juliet, I'll ask her, I'll say, hey, just kind of curiosity, where else do you network? So that's kind of how my, my plan. Yeah, and I can, um... I'll respond to that, right? Uh, places I network, um, first of all, I think it's really important that in any, any industry you're in, that you're following thought leaders that you respect and you wanna emulate. And LinkedIn's a really great place for that because you can follow them and then they will tell you where they're showing up, right? So if you're following me on LinkedIn, then you would know that I was speaking on this panel tonight. And if you respect and or are interested in my work or my industry, then that's an event that you can go to kind of in this air of what we've already talked about with networking, right? They're like, oh, because you trust my work and my process, then you can trust the spaces that I'm putting myself in. Um, so following um, folks that you respect, who you want to emulate, seeing where they show up, going to those places. And then like Chris said, when you tap into a couple different contacts, continuing the trend and asking them where did they show up is a really great place to do that um, in an organic way that is building off of your natural curiosity that isn't just opening up Eventbrite and getting overwhelmed by the millions of options there are. And and I also highly recommend finding like local specific spaces because um, there's still something really, really important about bonding over the weather and bonding over local politics and bonding over how your city's handling COVID. Like we are all, as much as it feels like we're in a global world right now, it's still really important to, to reach into your local communities and develop the relationships that eventually will come off of Zoom and you might run into each other at a coffee shop. And that just adds a really nice layer. So looking for, um, you know, like one of my favorite spaces is Creative Mornings because it's broad and it's about creatives, but you can identify with that word however you want to and show up in that space. And they do both virtual and local events um, where it's kind of like a TED Talk style where they highlight people 
people in the local community who are doing real, really cool things in creative industries, but also like associations like UXPA or AIGA, where, yeah, maybe you pay some dues, but you're going to get access to all of these different events curated custom for your industry is also a really smart way to kind of dive deep if you don't have a lot of time and you really need to tap into the bloodline of your of your industry knowledge. And I, and I will tell you, and, and, and everything that Juliet said is absolutely true. Um, a, a lot of times um, when I'm looking for a networking event, uh, when I look for a networking event, I really judge it by, by three things. Uh, first of all, is quite simply time of day. Um, I have found for me in, in my business, in, in, in my most effective networking, I really try not to go to stuff at night. Um, a lot of times it's drinking fest, which is fine. If that's what you're into. Um, not a lot of businesses, bu business goes on in, in most of the ones I've been to. The second thing I look for is I try and, and reach out to the event sponsor and find out who's going to be in the room and see if there are people that I, that I want to associate with, that I've been looking for to associate with. And the last one I look for is if there is a speaker, do they have a compelling topic? Um, one of the things I will tell you guys is that you don't have to network just at business type networking events. If you go to church and your, your Sunday school class can be a, a networking organization. If you have beagles or uh, like Rhodesian Ridgebacks like I do, dogs, whatever. Um, if you play chess, any, any group that you belong to that um, you enjoy and you, you go to on a regular basis is a possible networking event. I, I totally agree with that. I've networked at the Y. I, I always was at the Y. People knew me. I got to know people in the in the boxing class that I was in. I ended up having coffee with some people from Magira Jesse that I wanted to meet so that I could like get connected in with them. So you never know where you're going to meet people. So just be open to it wherever you go. Um, also, if you're into Slack, join Slack communities. You'll see people, these are Slack communities that interest you and you'll see people share events that they're going to. So those are all really great. So kind of piggybacking off of what Juliet said, like find out where the people that you already have, you know, in interest in, where are they going? And Slack is a great place to find those kinds of things. Um, there's a bunch of questions in the chat. I definitely want to come back to a couple of mine, but I want to touch on some of these questions. Um, I really like this question. What books do you recommend about networking? Uh, I love the book. You can talk to anyone by, is it Leo Loudness? I don't know how to say the last name, but uh, do you all have any favorite books? Yeah, I just dropped in the chat. Um, it's not technically a networking um, book, but I often find that like networking is just about how to talk about yourself and, and share that with the world and how you build relationships. And a lot of that boils down to your self-confidence and your insecurities. And so looking for books that can help you in some way, just like get more comfortable with sharing your thoughts in a way where you're not worried about how it's being perceived or how other people are judging you when you're talking is really going to help you show up to networking without getting so in your head and self auditing and self editing as you're talking with folks. Um, so I love the book, You're a Badass, How to Start, How to Stop Doubting Your Greatness and Start Living an Awesome Life by Jen Sincero. I think it's um, just a really kind of good blanket conversation around um, getting out of your head and really embodying yourself. So you're not um, stuck inside of the kind of voyeuristic doubts of what other people see you as, and you're more interested in what you're bringing to the world. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, I I like um, Networking Like a Pro by Ivan Meisner. For those of you who don't know who Ivan Meisner is, he's the, uh, Dr. Ivan Meisner founded BNI. Um, and it's, it's a really great read, uh, especially if you're, if you're new into networking and really looking to get started on it. Um, the other one I like is a little bit um, uh, uh, kind of out there as far as networking goes. Uh, it's a book called Referral of a Lifetime by Tim Templeton. Um, and it really does a great job of, of identifying, of helping you identify who you are and then how to build your referral network, which is what we're really talking about. 
with networking as a whole, it's a, it's a referral network, whether it's, you know, referring jobs, referring information. Um, one of the most powerful things that you can do when you're faced with a client or a friend or just a neighbor is uh, when they ask you something, say, I know a guy or I know a person. Um, that, that really builds credibility um, and can help set you apart. So Referral of a Lifetime by Tim Templeton is a, is a great one. It's not a networking book per se, but if you, if, but if you use it and, and work through it, it'll help you build a great network. And in, in, in it's, it's pretty simple and it it's, can be a lot of fun. I was trying to find this one book that I read. Um, I'll have to look it up. Uh, it was, the, the book is awesome because it talks about how to have conversation with anyone and it, all about these conversation sparkers, which can spark deeper conversations that um, people are more engaged with. So I'll find that. Um, and I think that kind of brings me to another question is like, it's really intimidating to walk into an event, an event of people you don't know, or a conference that's full of people that might know each other, and you're not, you don't know. So what do you think is the best way to approach someone, particularly when you're feeling really unsure and, and shy of yourself? Yeah, um, one of the things that I try and do, um, especially if this is a new group for me, if this is somebody I've never, a group I've never been to before, um, I try and reach out to the, the host of the event a couple days in advance, um, especially if it's an in-person event. You know, how can I help you? Do you need anything? Can I come early, help you set up, stay late, help you break it down? Generally, the organizers of events are the movers and shakers. They're the ones that know a lot of people. And then when you're talking to them and you're having these conversations with them, ask them, who should I meet? Who, who, who do you in this room do you recommend that I meet? Who knows a lot of people? Who is a connector? And a lot of times they will introduce you to that person because um, it helps them. It helps the event, makes it look, makes them look good, makes them feel important. And it's a real easy way um, to meet that person that you want to meet because, guys, there is nothing more intimidating than going up to two or to a group of two or three people that are already having a conversation and trying to break into that group. If you can find somebody to help give you, to, to help bridge that gap and open that door for you and give you that introduction, it will, first of all, you'll feel more comfortable. You'll not stumble through your words and, 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 and feel like you're an idiot when you try to say something, which I have done. And it will give you instant credibility because, hey, um, Cindy, who's the, the, the leader of this group, she's introducing Juliet to me. That means that she must think enough of, of Juliet uh, to come over and make that introduction. Yeah, and I would also say, don't be afraid to mess up. <laughs> um, I know that's not answering the question, but just speaking to Chris's point of like, we're human, that's the whole point of this. So in some ways, lean into the flaws, lean into the like, I think a little bit of vulnerability goes a long way. So just saying, hey, it's my first time I've ever been here tonight. How often do you show up in this space? Or offering something about yourself for that person to respond to rather than putting all of the ownership on you to try and conjure the right words or the right introduction. And instead just offering something right off the bat um, about, hey, I came here tonight in order to do X, Y, and Z. What brought you to this space, right? And just kind of um, uh, standing in your confidence in a way that doesn't make that person feel like they have to give you anything, but that they can meet you where you're at, whether you're in a new and vulnerable space or if that's a place you show up really often. Um, and I would also challenge the people who are the regulars to like go loop those people in, right? That when you see those kinds of of clusters forming, um, make an effort uh, to get outside of your comfort zone where maybe you're talking to the five people that you see often at these networking events. Um, but also that's not you challenging yourself either to see who might be new in the room that you haven't connected with yet. And just because they're new in that space doesn't mean they're, a value, they're not a valuable connection in the industry or they don't have something to offer or they're not working on a really cool project you'd like to be a part of. And um, so it goes both ways, but I think um, being genuine and being curious 
Um, and then being vulnerable and thinking about what is something I can share about myself that I'm okay sharing that's going to be a, a way for us to connect, whether it's what brought you there that night, um, what is a fear that you are trying to conquer in that space, because there's nothing more tender than you coming in and saying, I'm really, really scared about my elevator pitch. Could I just pull you over for a second and practice it? And would you just listen, you know? And sometimes that can break the ice in a way that saves you kind of the, the anxiety of standing in the corner trying to come up with a great pitch. Instead, you can just lead with the truth and see what that can get you. And I think a lot of times you're gonna be surprised by how generous and kind people can respond to that kind of honesty. Yeah, and Juliet, Juliet hit on a really important thing. Guys, when you're talking to people, the death of the conversation when you're in a group is the closed-ended question. What do I mean by the closed-ended question? It's a question that when you've answered it, there's nowhere else to go. And the biggest one is something that we've all said. I don't care if, this, if you've never been to a networking event before. If you've been to a party at any point, any time, any place, anywhere, you've asked this question. And the question is, what do you do for a living? <laughs> yep. when you, yeah. When you ask that question, once you've answered it, unless you have some strong commonalities with that person, like you're in a, the same industry or a similar industry, that's dead. It, does, it can't go anywhere. So one of the, the things that I did when I first started networking is I walked in the door with about five or six open-ended questions that I could build off of. So if I'm talking to Cindy at a networking event, I might say, hey, Cindy, tell me, tell me what you're really excited for for 2022. What are you working on that really excites you? That fosters a conversation because Cindy's going to tell me, you know, what she's excited about. Well, then I can follow up with, um, well, what are your challenges? What's, what's preventing you from completing this project? Another one is, and it sounds really silly, um, you know, if ask them how long they, this is what I asked you, are you from Austin originally? Now that sounds like a closed in question, but whether the answer is yes, which is tell me about your experiences in Austin, where'd you go to high school, whatever, or no, well, what brought you here? How did you end up here? Where did you come from? These are all open-ended questions that can help facilitate that conversation so you don't feel the pressure and you're not in the spotlight because you're asking the question. You know what my favorite question to ask is? What do you like to do for fun? Yep. I get the best answers from that. I had a whole conversation. This gentleman uh, told me he did model trains and like had this whole room in his garage where he did trains and he would spend a lot. I mean, like we spent a long time and he became a really close friend because I came up to him later. I'm like, oh, hey, have you been doing the, you know, your trains lately? And he's like, how she remembered. So those kinds of things really make a huge difference too with getting personal with people. I love it. Um, we have a really cool question. Is there a good <laughs> real life example in your experience that someone has effectively caught your attention through networking? Putting you on the spot here. Has effectively caught my attention through networking. Hmm. Uh, I would say that someone has, that, yes, there was someone that was, that um, had taken enough time to, to learn about me. I, this was some, somebody that obviously walked in the door knowing that they wanted to meet me. This was someone who had done their homework and they came with very specific questions um, about my background and about my experiences, and they were truly seeking information. People love giving advice. And it's, it's just our nature. We love to give advice. So it, it, this person, like I said, came very, or they asked somebody, I'm not, not exactly sure how that came to be, but they had very specific questions about me, about how I did my business, about what kind of coaching I did about how I grew my, how I've been so successful in growing businesses. They really did, and, and, and that was really impressive. Yeah, and I would add to like on the virtual side of things, um, 
when people uh, actually go invest, so for example, I was in a film in 2020 and currently the film is uh, going into film festivals. So it's showing in film festivals um, in the independent circuit. And I shared about that on LinkedIn and I had someone who didn't know me, hadn't approached me yet, but invested watched the film before we'd had a conversation and then used that to enter into my LinkedIn messages and said, I really loved the film. I took the time to watch it. This is how it, it you know, this is how I responded to it. It's so great. And, and actually shared, you know, how they saw the connections between the multiple points of my career path. And to me, that's someone who's gonna go above and beyond, who's not just invested in how they can use me, but is invested in the connection of who I am as a person and the multiplicity of what I'm bringing to the industry, not just as a coach, not just in UX, not just as an artist, but as a person who's really sharing my journey in all of those roles that that I play and is trying to connect on a personal level using the resources I'm putting out there that are available that if you really want to be in relationship to me, going the extra mile is going to work. I love that. There have been a couple of questions um, from folks who are switching careers um, from, you know, one career into UX and the advice that uh, we have for networking, I guess, for a job. I wasn't sure, Yusuf, if you were, wanted to explain more about what advice you're specifically looking for, if you don't mind coming off mute, if you're still here. That's okay. You don't have to. Uh, but uh, Nicole, you asked a similar question. Do you want to explain what it, your question a little bit? I'm going to pick on you. Yeah, sure. So um, I recently completed a UX boot camp, and so I am trying to get that first job. And my network has been really valuable with advertising jobs. And since I'm trying to leave that behind, um, I am curious how to leverage that network of people who know that I am a solid worker, a good person. Um, but who don't necessarily have any, um, can't really vouch for my UX design skills. So I'm, I'm going to tell you as a business owner, and, and just so you know, I, at one point I had three um, Roto-Rooter plumbing franchises. I had 120 employees in two states. I'm less concerned about your experience and I'm more concerned as a business owner about who you are because I'm bringing you into my business family. So those connections that you don't discount, I, I know you wanna get away from the advertising world, I can understand that. But who in your, in your, of your advertising con, the, the, the whole purpose of, 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 of a network, well, there's many, but one of them is you're not, you're not networking and marketing and quote unquote selling to your network you're selling through your network. So statistically, each and every one of us knows up to 200 people. Some of us know way more than that. Even introverts, if, when you start looking at your LinkedIn, your Facebook page, um, you know, you, it's, a lot of us know way more than 200 people, but 200 people is about the average. So you can actually, this is where the power of LinkedIn really can, can do wonders for you. LinkedIn has a way where you can where you can separate your contacts by tiers. So a first tier contact is Cindy and I. Cindy and I are first tier contacts. Juliet is not a first tier contact of, of mine because we haven't met before and we haven't connected. She's what we call a second tier contact. We have Cindy in common as a first tier contact. You can segregate by those second tier contacts and find out who the people that you know, know that you want to know. And there is somebody on this call who will remain nameless, who contacted me and asked me and did this very thing and asked me if I knew somebody who was pretty high up at the San Antonio Zoo. And would I be willing to introduce her to my friend at the San Antonio Zoo? And, and luckily I was able to, to accomplish that, I'm not sure what the end result of that, of that phone call was. I'm not sure if they ended up doing business together or not. 
Um, but that person, that person used that used LinkedIn very effectively um, to isolate who she wanted to work with, whether it was a customer or or somebody in in her sphere, uh, to to tap into that existing network. She had to find that that information out. Yeah, and I would speak to transferable experience. Um, I hands down, yes, love second degree, the, the leverage of the introduction, even if it's a person um, who maybe, you know, they met that person once, um, they don't even have to do the introducing. If you just ask for consent and say, would it be okay if I referenced your name when I introduce myself to this other person? That can go a really long way and just kind of helping see people see the web, right? Sometimes it's hard. You need, to, you need to build those connections when you see them and then share those with people so they can see them too. That's really important because then if they can go, oh, you know so and so they don't have to know how you know them they don't but just the fact that you have the consent to leverage that relationship and say you don't know this but i know that we have this person in common and so i wanted to share that with you because i'm interested in x y and z the other thing that i would add to um so that's me just like kind of touching base on and affirming like exactly what chris said um in my own experience coaching um, folks who are transitioning uh, industries, it's really important that you start investing in specific communities. So my, um, and this is touching uh, a bit on one of the questions I saw in the chat regarding like follow-up and how exhausting it can be. If your networking strategy is just one-on-one -on -one relationships, you're gonna feel really exhausted really fast. Mm -hmm. So I use the kind of what I call the watering hole technique, right? Of like have three places that you can show up consistently. One can be a local place, one can be a virtual place, and one can be like a Slack channel or something like that. But the three places I recommend are have something that's local, have something that's industry specific, and have something that's affinity based with one of your identity factors. Um, so affinity spaces are really important because they're not necessarily relative to your industry. So you can stand out a little bit, but you share a worldview in common with the people who are showing up in that place, whether you're showing up based off of um, your racial demographic, your gender identity, your um, religious affiliation, all of those parts are components of affinity. And those places can be really powerful as well in leveraging second degree contacts that aren't necessarily specific to your industry but people are really going to vouch for you because they understand your world view they understand your experience and that inherently creates a really intentional bond find those places show up in those places as much as you can so i always say try to go to one of those places once a month and you're going to average three events minimum a month right that's one a week that's keeping you on rotation it's keeping in those places it's keeping you consistent and then out of those places you can then hone and curate and, de and develop who you want to get those one-on-one -on -one relationships going with. Um, and that's a more sustainable way to network than trying to do all the one-on-one -on -one outreach yourself um, and then feeling like you have to keep that relationship going on your end without having something in common to help facilitate that repetition, which is where events really, really play in your benefit for the long term. Um, and I would say if you're transitioning industries it's really pivotal that you find one of those industry spaces that are specific to UX so you're not relying totally on your previous community but you're still leveraging them in the way that Chris mentioned but you're also looking out for your future. Absolutely the, one of the biggest mistakes people make in networking it doesn't matter whether they're looking for a new job or you know a client or whatever is they only use one strategy. Guys the this statistically one-to-one one-on-ones is the best way statistically to 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 have that success but it also takes the longest i mean i in my bni group there was a guy that was a, an ideal client for me it took me 50 touches to land in that and that's extreme but you need to you need to be networking in more than one place. That is absolutely critical. And it, it, for those of you who are at some point are going to own your own business and do your own marketing, it, it, that that statistic holds just as true. You need a long term 
strategy, you need a middle strategy, you need a short-term strategy. Um, some place, a short-term strategy, some place where you can just put, you can put your name out there and your skill set and whatever you get is whatever you get. It's a hit it and forget it strategy. Mm -hmm. Kind of like social media, using social yeah. media for something like that. Yeah, yes. that was a good question about that. There's actually a really um, good question that kind of touches on this whole idea of like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. So um, how, what do you think is the comparison between online, like meetup conferences versus uh, offline so, or in-person uh, type events? Like, is it more efficient, less efficient? What is your thought process on that? I tend to lean to the fact that, or at least for me personally, that in-person events are more efficient. But I will tell you, Zoom can be, the, 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 virtual, the virtual conferences, the virtual events can be just as efficient. But guys, it does require a little bit more work. You have to be a little bit more aggressive. So if I see somebody in an event like this one that I really want to meet, I have to take that extra step. As soon as that event is over, I have to be reaching out to that person and say, hey, um, I really love what you have to say on the event. I'd really like to get to know you better. Um, can we set up a time to have a have a one-to-one -one, either via Zoom or, or in person if you can do that? It does require that extra aggressive step to make it successful. I, I increase my business by, by 50% in a COVID world, networking via Zoom. It can be done, but it does require a little bit more, a, a little bit more aggressiveness on your part than it does um, in a regular networking type format. I would say I'm a big fan of a mix. I think they both challenge different parts of you. Um, so for example, in person, I think it keeps you vulnerable because it is scarier than having the, the kind of the worldwide web kind of as the block between you. Um, and so in that way, it keeps you accountable to working on your story, to working on, you know, your, your insecurities, um, working on being curious about other people and not just being so stuck in your own head that you're not just talking about trains with Cindy, right? Like, which it can be really fun in a way that like, you don't get that kind of vibe over LinkedIn. It's just really hard to create that way. And that's the benefit of being in person versus online. You have the benefit of research at your disposal. You can research panelists. You can research who's going to be at the event. You can drop your LinkedIn. It's so much more instantaneous. And so in that regard, when you are online and you're networking with events, you have the power of getting to consider what you want to bring into that space and prepare it ahead of time, whether that's information about somebody that you want to connect with them about, whether it's dropping a link um, in the chat and like getting used to being, um, you know, putting yourself out there, whether it's, you know, getting people to connect with you on LinkedIn. I think there's pros and cons to both. And like Chris has already mentioned, you got to play both fields. If you're just leaning into one space and expecting it to give everything, you're always ignoring another part of you. So I use the idea not as in one versus the other, but more like this week, what do I have the energy for, right? So do I have the energy to lay in my bed the night before I'm going to this conference and just like Google people and LinkedIn and that's what I have energy for this week? Or do I have a light week the following week and I want something that's going to get me out of my house and my apartment because I work from home 24 hours. So don't be afraid to play to your strengths and play to your energy and use it that way rather than trying to think about what can I get out of this. Think about what can I give and what is my capacity and then using that to help you vet where you can show up and when. I love that too because um like there was there was a question here and is it isn't nurturing the network hard the answer is yes yes <laughs> i mean yes. Yes. yes um but it but it's the long game right like and you know you have to, i i love that like thinking about your energy there have been plenty of times when i thought i was going to make it to an <clears throat> evening event and i decided no i am not going to be my best self showing up at this event because i'm exhausted so, and I used to go to evening events all the time. And now I've kind of gotten to the point where I only do lunches now. That's usually the only thing I have energy for. Or evening 
like meetups, like online. To me, I've kind of found my mix. And then I follow up and I stay in touch with people on LinkedIn and it, or phone calls. I literally called Chris this week. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Wanna come to a meetup? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. Um, so I love all that. I'm checking the chat, making sure because um, we have a lot of comments in the chat. I want to make sure that I get to most everybody's questions. I, I saw one. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah, uh, there was one about uh, with LinkedIn asking when you see the hey, my company is hiring. How do you go about that? And how do you start that conversation without just posting, I'd be great for the job? Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little, I would like to ask a clarification on the question. Is this someone that you know that's posted, hey, my company is hiring, or is it an unknown person to you just happen to stumble across it and see it? Does it, does it specify? It, it doesn't specify, but I would guess it's within their network. Okay. That you know. Morgan, you, is that your question? Yeah, I was gonna. I was sorry. I was trying to jump in. That was my oh, question. Sorry. No, it's fine. I'm glad it was answered because it's something that I keep thinking of, and they are not. They're actually not in my. They're in my network, so I'm seeing their posts, but it's not someone I know particularly. Yeah, uh, Morgan, do you know somebody who knows them? E maybe. Okay. Yeah, what, see, so I have a client and just kind of to talk about the power of LinkedIn before we address your question specifically. Um, LinkedIn, I have a client that has 4,000 LinkedIn connections. And he, he, he told me, he explained it to me this way. He said, LinkedIn connections are an inch deep and a mile wide. And a lot of times when you reach out to people in your network and ask them about LinkedIn, about their LinkedIn connections, you're going to get one of a couple answers. The first one is, is, oh, yes, I absolutely know that person. Um, and I would feel very comfortable in introducing them. That, that's an option. I will say in most cases, in my experience, that's 25% or less. Um, you're going to get about 50% that say, yeah, I know that person, but I don't know them very well. They just reached out to me and I just click yes. Um, that's about 50%. The other 25% is going to be, uh, yes, I know that person very well. I really don't feel comfortable introducing you uh, for whatever reason. And I have a friend like that. He, he is very reclusive that way. This is the kind of guy you don't ask him for favors. And I've had people that have reached out to me uh, to introduce, to have me introduce that, that particular person to him. And I, I, I won't do it. Um, so if it's somebody that you may know through a third party, um, I would try and reach out to that. If not, if it's just, hey, my company's hiring and you think you'd be a perfect fit, go ahead and throw the, do some homework. But go ahead and 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 um, and throw your application in, throw your resume in. Look, what we're, what you're really trying to do in the hiring process, especially with larger companies, is you are trying to get around the human resources person. The resource, the human resources person, in most cases, is not your friend. They are they can't say yes to you, but they can say no. So go to the company's website that you're looking at, see it, see who, because I love this page. If, if I, when I go to company's websites, nothing makes me happier than when they have a page that says about us. It is a virtual gold mine for networkers and job seekers because they'll, they'll tell you everything you need to know. They'll draw you a map of how to approach that person. And then it's up to you to do a little digging and see who do I know that knows the person that's above the human resources person that can say yes, but you've got to get around that human resources person because they can't say yes, but they can say no. Did that help Morgan? Yes, it did. Thank you. So there is a really good question about 
you know, sometimes for in-person event, events, it's good to go with like a buddy because then it feels a little bit less intimidating. But what about online events? How do you, uh, how do you, what do you recommend going about like networking with attendees for, for online events? What's your strategy? I think the buddy system applies to online too. I mean, it, it's the same idea. It's accountability. It's someone you're going to look for when you get there in the chat. It's a person you can secretly DM while people are talking and you can get some of those nerves out or you can send them a DM and say, I'm going to ask this question. Does this sound weird? And they can, you know, DM you while things are happening and say, no, I think you should ask it, right? Like there still can be that rapport virtually. Um, and I think it's it's also important to remember that like, if you're doing this work, there's probably another person who'd be really grateful for the invite, who might not know about the spaces you know about, right? Like I think so many, so many, so, so often people discredit the value they're already bringing in the world. And so we internalize this imposter syndrome about how we're showing up and we can never do enough. And like chances are, if you invite someone else, they're gonna be one really touched that you thought about them and two, you might be introducing them to a space that they didn't know about. And I think that's also the responsibility of paying this experience forward to people is not just always being the person who's looking for the thing, but being the person who's willing to share too is just as valuable. And buddy system is a great way to show that you're putting in the work, that you're trying. You can literally put it out a shout out on LinkedIn and say, I'm going to this event. Does anyone want to go with me? Show people your effort. It counts. It absolutely does. And, you know, if you can't find a networking buddy to go with you, whether it's in person or virtual, there are still things that you can do to, to lessen that, um, that fear and that anxiety. Guys, I promise you, I don't care whether this is your first event or your hundredth event, you're going to be nervous because there's going to be somebody in that room that you don't know that you're going to, that you're going to be talking to. You don't know them and they don't know you. Everybody in that room is nervous. Everybody in that room at one point or another has stepped on their tongue. Some of us have done it more than once. Walk in there with a set of open-ended questions. You can Google this icebreaker questions. It doesn't have to be intimidating. Where are you from? How did you get here? Um, what have you got planned? Tell me, are you taking a vacation anytime soon? My goal at a networking event, and I'm going to give you one of my big secrets right here. So please pay attention. And this works for interviews too, guys. This is a dual, this is a dual threat one. My goal is to get you, as the person that I'm talking to, to talk 80% of the time. Why am I, do I want to get you to talk 80% of the time? Because if you're, it's physically impossible to talk and listen. And the more you talk about yourself, the more I'm listening, the more I can keep repeating back things back to you and especially in an interview I can give you the answer that you're looking for this is a classic mistake that interviewers make they're so excited to tell you about their company that if you're listening and you're paying attention in the interview process they will draw you a roadmap on how to get the job it's about listening to what they say and repeating it back to them in a networking situation, if you do that, like Cindy said with the trains, she kept asking the guy about the trains. I guarantee you that guy walked away and said, wow, that Cindy Brummer is real, a really nice person. She's exactly like me. She is someone that I could get along with. And so make that your goal, especially for the introverts. Make that your goal to, to have enough pre-prepared questions to get that person to go to talk 80% of the time, but also know when to be flexible. If you see the person that you're talking to in a networking event that wants to go down a path, let them go. Let them keep going. You never know where it's going to take you. You never know what, what information and what knowledge you might glean from them. And you, you don't know who they know. 
Yeah, I, I agree with all that. And regarding, like, just based on my experience with online events, um, one of the things I've noticed that really helps is when you're visible in some way. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to turn on your camera, but I think we all tend to like stay invisible depending on our mood. So some things that make you more visible are to speak up in the chat, ask questions. This is all like, you'll catch the attention of people, whether it's the organizer, the panelists, or you know, other people at the event. Uh, we have someone that comes to UX and ATX regularly that is, I never see their face, but they're so active in the chat by repeating back things that you know, we've heard or, or whatever that I, I recognize that person, that's a person who's networking with me. So you can do it in your own special way. And it, you can make yourself visible in those events by being an active participant. So if, if you go to a networking event and you're just a fly on the wall, you're kind of missing out on an opportunity. Um, so I would highly recommend figuring out what feels best for you to make yourself visible in some way, shape, or form. Hey, Cindy, there was one that just came in the chat that I'd like to address if that's okay. Yeah, please. It's from Robert. Um, the question is, what is a good elevator pitch suggestion for a newbie slash uh, career switcher? Um, so guys, I went to one of the, it was, it was a networking event I went to early on. Um, it was an event at a local chamber and everybody stood up and gave a marketing moment. Um, and in their marketing moment, they did a great job. Everybody did a great job telling me what their business did and how and how it worked. And, and you know, and some of them did a, a, an OK job of telling me what made them different from their competition. This is where they failed. This is where they failed, right here. They did not tell me how their good or their service was going to help me and make my life better. And it doesn't matter whether you're selling a product or a service or yourself. As an employer, if I'm looking to hire somebody, or even if I'm not looking to hire somebody, I'm looking for somebody who can make my life better. It is up to you to tell me how you're going to make my life better. And guys, I'm going to give you my elevator pitch uh, here uh, real quick so you can kind of see an idea of what I'm talking about. So if I, and I use this one specifically, if I go to uh, an event uh, for a group that I've never been to before. So here's how it goes. Good afternoon, my name is Chris Gay and I own Focal Point of Austin. And I have two questions for you. Who here wants to make more money? Who wants to work less hours doing it? My minimum expectation for my clients is a 20% year over year growth. And generally my clients work up to 250 hours per year less. If that sounds like something that you might be interested in, see me after the meeting, let us set up a one-to-one, -one. let's talk about it. My name is Chris Gay, I own Focal Point of Austin and I can help you tame your tiger. Did I ever mention in that elevator pitch anywhere, anything about coaching. I didn't even say it in the name, but what I did was I painted a picture because every business owner in that room's mind immediately went to whatever 20% increase of their current number is. And I've never met a business owner yet that said, I really would like to work more hours. When you're talking about your elevator pitch, whether you're out looking for a job or a client, tell me how you are going to make my life better. That is the key to the whole thing. And it's the biggest thing that you can do to differentiate yourself from everybody else in the room. 
And that's the trick, right? Trying to figure out how to craft that statement of what makes sense to describe you. Yes. And so when you're crafting the statement, guys, play to your strengths. You, I can be in a room full of eight other coaches and Juliet's um, experience and her ideal client and what makes her unique in her market space is different from my ideal client, my experiences, and what, um, what, makes, what makes me unique in mine. It doesn't mean that I'm a better coach than Juliet. It doesn't mean that she's a better coach than me. We're just different. And I'm not the right coach for everybody. And I think that Juliet would agree that she's not the right coach for everybody either. But it's about differentiating yourself. So as the consumer, in this case, you can make an intelligent decision about which is the right person for you. And then as a designer, I would add on to that, you know, when you're talking to people, you're, you're the hiring managers or the person that you're networking with is trying to find out what makes you different from other designers. So play to your strengths because every designer is different and not every designer fits in every single company. You all probably have preferences about the kind of companies you want to work with, the kind of work-life balance you have. And so sometimes you need to think about how to say those things so that people can get a feel for who you are. So you can figure that out right away and not be chasing down, you know, people to network with that you're really not going to end up, you know, having any kind of synergies with in the long haul. So it's okay to like, bring your personality out in a lot of what you do. Yeah, and I'll add to what Cindy says on personality. I think it's really important. One of the things that um, a lot of my career transitioners get really nervous about is I don't know enough about the industry to say anything relevant. And I always think it's really important that when you're, especially in an elevator pitch, that you're not just placing your value on where you've been, but where you're trying to go. So talk about your ambition. You might not have your past in common with somebody, but you might both be trying to get to the same place. And that can be something that you can build off of together. It doesn't have to be where you've been. It doesn't have to even be the skill set or the experience you have. But if it's a dream, if it's a goal, it's the way you're trying to have an impact in the world that is value-based and that is something that people can get on board with regardless of where you're coming from and regardless of your expertise. So don't diminish the power of naming where you're trying to go and seeing who wants to join you in that process because that's going to unite you in the path of your future. It's not going to limit you by the people who have already been where you've been but maybe don't have the same goals in mind. So make sure you're adding that when you're introducing people to yourself so that they can, if maybe they might even be in position to help you get there, which is really important. If that's someone who says, cool, you're interested in like futurist uh, AI work, that's what my company does. That's really great. What interests you about that? This is what our product is doing right now, right? It can spark an idea. It can spark a conversation that maybe before you wouldn't have felt expert enough or validated enough to say, you know, I'm an AI designer, but at the same time, if that's something you're interested in and that's a passion, don't underestimate the value that can bring to the potential relationship if that's something you might in the future have in common with the person you're talking with. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. And the one thing that I, I want to underline about what Juliet said is don't discount your, your previous history. Um, as a prospective employer, I'm not looking for Audemans. I'm not looking for, you know, a cookie cutter version of something I already have. Because as an employer, I'm smart enough to know that you can't solve a problem with the same mentality that created it. And you need that you need that um, infusion of fresh ideas. And one person's irrelevant statement is an, another person's million dollar idea. And if they're gonna dismiss a statement that you make is irrelevant, then it may not be the right fit for you. I love that. James, do we have any outstanding questions or does anybody have any burning questions that you wanna throw in the chat right now? Not seeing any others in the chat. So this is your moment, everyone. This is it. You've been holding on. 
This is the time. I think somebody had a question about um, elevator pitches. Um, one of the resources that I really use for to, to help me craft my elevator pitch, the one I just gave you guys, uh, was a great book. It's called Building Your Story Brand by Donald Miller. Um, it's a fantastic read. It, it's, it is designed more for business owners and, and marketing professionals, but you can really use that uh, resource to help you uh, craft a great um, uh, great elevator pitch. It's a little bit long. It'll take you a little while to do it, but a good elevator pitch can really open a lot of doors for you. So Beverly has a question. If there is a position that you're going to apply for and you're connected with someone that works at the company, does it make sense to reach out to them? And if yes, then what would be the best way, um, what would be the best way to make it a connect to make a connection with them? And is it better to reach out before you apply or after? That's a lot of yes. questions, Beverly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes to all. Um, it is definitely, but you, look, you want to, I always liked it when I was interviewing people, no matter whether it was at Rotorooter or Apple or, or wherever I've been, where I've been interviewing a lot of people. Um, I like people who bring questions. It is especially specific questions about, about my business. It means you cared enough to do your homework and you're really curious about me and my business. So use whatever source of information that you can to get that in to, to, to get that information, to get that inside information that can help you craft meaningful questions. Um, and so if I've got a source like that in a company, um, I'm calling them up and I'm calling them up before the interview and I'm calling them after the interview. Hey, can I buy you lunch? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Let's get together. Let's talk. Let's catch up. Um, yeah, when it comes to somebody that I want to work with or work for, for that matter, I am shameless. I will do anything. I will talk to anybody uh, to, 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 to gain an edge over the other people um, that are, are trying to get that client or to get that job. Yeah, and I think um, it's really important to show folks that you're um, that you're willing to invest before you have a return, right? So that you're you're putting in the effort to um, ask about. I would ask that contact about their experience first, and then ask them if they're open to you asking some questions re relative to the job application because they might not be in the same department. Like you don't want to assume what they might know about the role. So get a sense of their experience in the company first or what might be some recommendations for what to highlight in your application that they might offer you. And then if they seem willing and invested in your journey at the company, then I would take that a step further and I would set up a call and I would say, okay, so here's the research that I've done. Is there anything you would add on to that or anything that you think I could specifically highlight from my experience that you think will be a value to the team or a value to the company culture or the value system of the product design um, and really get a sense of what do they need help with in their company? So like, what is the bottom line of their company and how do your experiences align with those needs? And then build that narrative in your interview questions and in your interview prep. Um, I often tell people, I don't think that the, um, the big uh, you know, value of a referral isn't just getting someone to get your resume on the hiring manager's desk. The power of the referral is actually having that person in your ear as you're going through the interview process, who's telling you about who's going to be on your panel interview, who's telling you who's in the background, like what they've done that they're bringing to that panel interview, why they're going to be on the panel, who's going to tell you about salary details inside of the company, who's going to tell you who's the person who's going to be a little bit easier to talk to and who's going to be the hard sell in the, in, in the team, on the firm, whatever that situation might be. And that's really the kind of detail that's going to set you up for success in the interview process aside from just the initial getting your resume across mm -hmm. the the finish line there's so much more invested especially in the ux process you're looking at three to four qualifying interviews you need someone to touch base with during that process and if you don't have that that person who does is automatically at an advantage just because they have insider information so definitely definitely reach out 
And, and while you're going through that process, especially if you're three, four, five, six interviews, guys, do yourself a favor. Don't try and second guess what the, what the person that's interviewing you is thinking. You're never going to guess it. You're, it's, it's a waste of time and energy, and you can put yourself through a lot of mental angst for no reason because I've been on both sides. You're never going to know what I'm thinking because I'm not going to tell you. And I remember walking out of, the, of my last um, interview at Apple, and I called my wife, and she said, how'd it go? And I said, I didn't get it. I absolutely did not get it when it was horrible. And it turned out that the, the guy that interviewed me ended up being my boss. And he told me, you are the best interview I've had in a very long time. You don't know what they're looking for. You don't answer your, answer the questions, honestly, to the best of your ability. And after that, don't worry about it. There's nothing you can do. So true. So true. I, I have done that. I've walked out in a, of an interview and I was like, oh man, that was the worst. And that's the one that where I got the job. <laughs> totally. It happens almost every time. Well, we're coming right up on 730. Um, can we please give a huge round of applause, snaps and claps for Juliet and Chris for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. This has been really valuable, I hope. I know it was for me. Um, really appreciate you coming. Um, please consider yourself UX and ATX members. Please join our Slack. <laughs> stay in touch with all of our team uh and then we will see everybody back uh soon be safe at south by southwest and all those conferences that you all are going to be going to and networking events share your experience with us on slack and tell us how it went all right okay well i'm going to close the meeting now because i have a whole class full of people to go teach so thank you all very much and have a good night good night guys good luck thank you Bye.